Well, thanks so much for having me. It's really an honor. I'm always amazed at spaces like this one and that I get to um, frequent such spaces. Um, it's really an opportunity. As young as I am, my grandparents on both sides of my family were sharecroppers. My mother's grandparents had been slaves, freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. My mother grew up in a family where if you were old enough to walk, you were old enough to pick cotton. And before she was nine years old, she had made a bit of a name for herself as the girl who could pick cotton faster and more efficiently than many of the grown men and women she worked alongside. So of course, I remain grateful for and in awe of my own life and of our lives together. And not just because I never picked cotton. My gratitude is made full by what my ancestors dreamed for us and by the parts of our lives we live that they may not have imagined. Whenever I'm with you, I think of so many dead people looking at us in disbelief. I think of them saying the word poet and cackling and slapping each other on the back in joy. Of course, it is difficult to speak of gratitude in the 21st century. Our social, our social media field lives has made, has made it a bit of a cliche, has made a cliche of the word itself, and we've seen words like grateful and blessed get caught up in the commodification that capitalism means to make of our souls. Uh, one example is my favorite song. There's a song that says, I'm way up, I feel blessed. Do y'all know this song? I love this song so much. You have to check it out. I would, I had planned to sing the whole song, but there are children. <laughs> uh, and often there is the opposite problem, that is when gratitude isn't somehow misshapen in our society, it seems to arrive with hints of shame. We have a difficult time understanding how it is possible to be thankful in a nation that wars against the environment against the rights women have over their own bodies, the right to love who you choose, the right to walk or sit or take a nap in your own damn bed when you're black or brown in this, the police state. And what is gratitude exactly in the life fully felt and lived? How do we properly honor the achievements of our lives while also understanding and tending to our losses? our failures, our bodies, which, if we are lucky, only get older. For instance, this was the best year of my life. I've always wanted to be a poet. Even as a kid, I understood language as consequential material. I imagined myself writing poems that called out with this language from my soul to another soul. And I did the thing that writers are told never to do. I wanted to know that someone had indeed answered the call. Yes, I wanted to make good work, but I also wanted to know that someone had indeed read it. It seems that all of my dreams came true in as much as we can measure, especially in a genre where measuring success is quite relative. I worked so hard on my last book that I always felt like it was working hard on me. I fell so in love with the ways it was wearing me out that I finally began to understand what people mean when they say the work is the reward. But there came other rewards. When I think of this last book's reception in context of my being a queer black man from the South who didn't go to an Ivy League school, I really do want to take off running in the sudden ways people did in the church where I was raised. And I probably would do just that if this hadn't been the worst year of my life. Before 
the book came out, I got pityriasis rosea, a skin rash that eventually covered my whole body and itched like a multitude of tiny fires beneath my skin. The cause of this condition is unclear and it went away after six of the most uncomfortable weeks of my life. Then at some point on this year long book tour I made for myself, I broke my toe for six weeks. I gave readings in a very unattractive orthopedic boot. <laughs> then I found out I had high blood pressure. Then I found out I had kidney disease. Then I found out that my kidney disease was brought on by a pill I took every night for years so that I could remain a person living with HIV rather than a person who dies of AIDS. Then my stomach started hurting so bad, I knew for certain that it was housing a small hamster who thought my intestines were its treadmill. I was soon diagnosed with a gastrointestinal disease that my doctor that my doctor believes was brought about by my blood pressure medication. Girl, a mess. <laughs> Most recently, a doctor has told me I may have what she called a bit of a chemical imbalance. That's in quotes, a bit of a chemical imbalance. In order to make what I guess was supposed to be a joke about symptoms, she asked me if I had been any, in any bar fights recently. I hope you understand. I really don't like doctors. Sometimes the road is darker than any idea of night. As I tell you to work hard on your writing, as I tell you to allow it to be the driving force of your life, it would be disingenuous of me not to tell you that any work you do will let you work yourself to death. There is no such thing as a tireless activist or a tireless artist. Every achievement, every metaphor that works must be celebrated. Every achievement also comes with it, a new set of responsibilities, expectations, and emails. And also, we must begin to celebrate ourselves enough to love us when we are not in the midst of writing, producing, editing, reviewing, or publishing. The world is hard enough on me without me piling the kind of stress onto myself that brings on the kind of health issues that lead to death. When I say the world is hard enough, I am thinking of the concerns that loom large for my students and for so many of the people I meet on the road. The question they ask me most is why it's okay to write poetry when they wanna be at Standing Rock, when they wanna to go to Ferguson. They want to know if poetry is a narcissistic act when it's clear that the world is on fire. Here is my answer to those questions. Everyone has a tree. Everyone in this room, full of people from rural and urban locations alike, has a tree. There is for each of us some tree we almost automatically think of as our own tree. My tree is a magnolia. And it's not in Louisiana where I'm from. It's in San Diego, California. And that has a lot to do with why it's my tree. But your tree might be a crepe myrtle. And maybe it's our tree because we once climbed it or because we once kissed someone near it or because it provided respite on a hot day. Or maybe it's our tree because we survived it Maybe it's our tree because it is the only witness to some event we managed to move past. But any way you look at it, some tree somewhere lives in our heart, whether we are with that tree or not. As I go to my seat, I need to tell you two things about that one tree. One, 
you love that tree without trying to explicate or close read it. You love that tree without thinking of what one of its branches may have meant in the context of 19th century theory. <laughs> Two, you never think of the person who planted that tree as a narcissist. In most cases, you never think of the person who planted the tree. You are not foolish enough to believe that the person who planted the tree put it there to add to the provision of oxygen. Our relationship to trees is a relationship to beauty. We don't read or explicate them, and yet we know they stand for something that feels like the truth. We also know deep within us that the person who planted the tree put it there for the sake of beauty. Now, I want you to imagine what your life would be like without that tree. What would your life be if that tree had never existed? Now, I want you to imagine your life without any trees at all. Think of all the trees you never even paid any attention to. That would include many of the trees here at Bennington. Imagine every day on this campus without any of the trees that were here with us. My relationship to my tree is tantamount to someone's relationship to one of my poems. I may never get to know that person or which poem makes them feel so enchanted. We make what we make for the fact and value of beauty. No one calls someone who plants trees a narcissist. When we make poems, we provide humankind with beauty and that beauty is important because even after it makes an impact upon your life, you never can measure just how much of an impact it has made. If you can't imagine these last few days without trees, I know you can't imagine life without poetry. Literature fills needs we did not know we had. Poems and stories plant seeds for things we didn't know we needed in spaces we didn't know existed. That is the case within this room and outside of it. What we've been called to do is grow language as necessary as any tree. And we have to be there for each other because no one else is going to understand that calling the way we must understand it for one another. Our gratitude is made full when we can be grateful for one another, when we can look left and right and understand that who we see is our legacy. Congratulations. Thank you.